We previously introduced the idea of an orthogonal complement when discussing the fundamental spaces of a matrix. For example, we discussed how the row space and the null space of a matrix are orthogonal complements. Now we're going to generalize that idea of an orthogonal complement to inner product spaces. We're going to go over the definition of orthogonal complements, prove some basic properties of them, and see an example. This video has chapters, so you can skip around as you please. Beginning with the definition. If W is a subspace of a real inner product space V, then the set of all vectors in V that are orthogonal to every vector in W is denoted like that. This is sometimes read as W perp, as in perpendicular. And it's called the orthogonal complement of W. That's what that is. Again, it's the set of all vectors in the relevant inner product space that are orthogonal to every vector in W. For an example, in this picture we're looking at R3, and this plane, W, through the origin, is a subspace of R3. The orthogonal complement of W turns out to be this line through the origin, W perp. Every single vector that exists on this line is orthogonal to every single one of these vectors in W. Here are two basic but important results about orthogonal complements which we will prove. If W is a subspace of a real inner product space V, then the orthogonal complement of W is also a subspace of that inner product space V. Also, the intersection of W and W perp, the orthogonal complement, is equal to the zero space, the subspace that contains only the zero vector. So W and its orthogonal complement will not have any vectors in common except for the zero vector, which agrees with this picture for what it's worth. To begin our proof for part A, showing that the orthogonal complement of W is a subspace of V, we'll begin by showing that the zero vector is in the orthogonal complement of W. To do this, notice that the inner product of 0 with W must be 0 for all vectors W in that subspace W. This is because the inner product of any vector with the 0 vector is equal to 0. So, by definition, 0 is an element of the orthogonal complement of the subspace W because the zero vector is orthogonal to every vector in the subspace W. So it's got to be in the orthogonal complement. Then all that remains is to show that the orthogonal complement of W is closed with respect to addition and scalar multiplication. Now that we know that the orthogonal complement of W is not empty, we can take arbitrary vectors from it. So let's take U and V from the orthogonal complement of W and note by definition of the orthogonal complement of W, the inner product of U with W and the inner product of V with W must both equal zero for any vector W that's in the subspace. Again, that's directly from the definition of orthogonal complement, and U and V are both in the orthogonal complement. Now we'll show that the orthogonal complement is closed under addition, so we need to show that the sum of these arbitrary vectors, U plus V, is an element of W perp. To do this, consider the inner product of u plus v with an arbitrary vector w from the subspace. By the additivity property, the inner product of u plus v with w is equal to the inner product of u with w plus the inner product of v with w. But both of these inner products have to equal zero because u and v are from the orthogonal complement of w. So if we take their inner product with any vector from that subspace w, we're going to get zero. Hence, this sum, u plus v, is also orthogonal to every vector from the subspace w, because of course this was just an arbitrary member of that subspace. Hence, by definition, u plus v is an element of the orthogonal complement of w. Again, that's because u plus v is orthogonal to every vector in w. Next, to show that the orthogonal complement is closed under scalar multiplication, we need to show that if we take the arbitrary vector u and multiply it by a scalar k, we stay inside the set w perp. 
To do that, we look at the inner product of KU with an arbitrary vector W from the subspace. By the homogeneity property of inner products, we can take that scalar K out of the inner product. So this is equal to K times the inner product of U with W. But again, since U is from the orthogonal complement and W is from the subspace W, this inner product has to equal zero. So this is equal to k times zero, which is equal to zero. This shows that k times u, the arbitrary scalar multiple of the arbitrary vector from w perp, is indeed orthogonal to every vector from the subspace w. Hence, KU is an element of the orthogonal complement of W. So we have that the orthogonal complement of W is non-empty, it's closed under addition, it's closed under scalar multiplication, and so it must be a subspace of that inner product space V. So if W is a subspace of V, so too is its orthogonal complement. For part B, we want to show that the intersection of W and its orthogonal complement is the set containing only the zero vector. And and this is relatively easy. If V is a vector that's in the intersection of W with its orthogonal complement, then of course, by definition of intersection, V is an element of W, and V is an element of the orthogonal complement. And this means that the inner product of V with V must equal zero, because V is an element of W, and it's also in the orthogonal complement. So V must be orthogonal to every vector in W, but V is a vector in W, so V has to be orthogonal to itself. So the inner product of V with V has to be zero, but we know that the only time that happens, that the inner product of a vector with itself is zero, the only time that happens is when the vector is the zero vector. Hence, any vector that's in this intersection of a subspace with its orthogonal complement would have to be the zero vector. So the intersection of a subspace with its orthogonal complement is the zero subspace. Now we'll look at one more property that we're not going to prove today, but I'll leave a link in the description to a lesson where we do prove it. This result probably feels pretty natural. It basically tells us that orthogonal complements occur in pairs. If we have a subspace, then another subspace is its orthogonal complement, but if we take the orthogonal complement again, we just get back to the original subspace. So if W is a subspace of a real finite dimensional inner product space V, then the orthogonal complement of the orthogonal complement of W is just W, which we can write like that. Perhaps that makes it more clear what is being said. So for example, going back up to that picture in R3, we had the subspace, which was this plane through the origin, and its orthogonal complement is this line, which is normal to the plane and also passes through the origin. The orthogonal complement of this line, which is itself a subspace, would just be the plane again. Let's finish with an example. We're asked to find a base basis for the orthogonal complement of the subspace of R5 spanned by these three vectors, W1, W2, and W3. The subspace of R5 that's spanned by these three vectors is the same as the row space of the matrix whose rows are the vectors. So consider this matrix whose rows are just taken as these vectors. We know that the row space of a matrix is orthogonal to its null space, so finding the orthogonal complement of the subspace that's spanned by these three vectors is equivalent to finding the null space of this matrix. So since the orthogonal complement that we're looking for is actually just the null space of this matrix, we'll go ahead and perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on the matrix in order to find a solution set for the null space. Performing Gauss-Jordan elimination on this matrix, you can verify, leads to this reduced row echelon form. And remember, the null space consists of all the 5 by 1 column vectors that we could multiply this matrix by in order to just get zeros. Since each of these rows represents an expression that we are setting equal to zero, from row 1, we have that x1 equals, adding everything to the right side, we have 2x2, plus 1x4, minus 3x5. And from row 2, we have that 1x3 equals negative 2x4, plus 2, 
x5. So x1 and x3 are our leading variables, but the other variables, x2, x4, and x5, are free variables. So we can assign them to arbitrary parameters, say x2 equals r, x4 equals s, and x5 equals t. Then the null space of the matrix consists of all vectors of this form, where r, s, and t are free. And of course, we can rewrite this vector as this sum of vectors, where each one captures the coefficients of one of the arbitrary parameters. This one is the coefficients of r, for example. And thus, it is these three vectors, which are linearly independent, which we can use as a basis for the orthogonal complement. These three vectors span the orthogonal complement of w. That's v1, that's v2, that's v3, and together we can combine these vectors in infinitely many ways to obtain all of the vectors in w perp. And again, this process always produces linearly independent vectors, so these three vectors do indeed form a basis for the orthogonal complement. So that's a little bit about orthogonal complements in inner product spaces. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access access to videos and extra practice, and if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes for this course. Thanks for watching. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about. Mama. Stressed out, honey, I've been stressed out lately. Don't know what's what, don't know what I'm stressed about. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about.